Okay, so welcome to this next video in uh, the playlist on the cardiovascular system. In this video, we're going to continue our discussion of endothelium-dependent hyperpolarization by introducing the concept of an endothelium-dependent hyperpolarization factor. So what we're going to see in this video is uh, some experiment that showed, well, appeared to show, that endothelium-dependent hyperpolarization was mediated by a uh, factor, basically. So, endothelium-dependent hyperpolarization factor. Okay, so, we're going to start off with just a brief reminder of what endothelium-dependent hyperpolarization is. Then what we're going to do is we're going to discuss an experiment done by uh, Thela II and Van Hoot, uh, which shows, or appears to show, that a factor is responsible for the endothelium-dependent uh, hyperpolarization. And what we're then going to do is uh, show that this um, factor is not a prostanoid, and it's not any sort of prostanoid. Okay, right, so let's have a reminder firstly of what endothelium-dependent hyperpolarization is. Okay, so, basically, if we have a uh, blood vessel, so let's say this is the blood vessel seen horizontally, well, seen, sorry, longitudinally. So here are the endothelial cells sitting on their basement membrane of collagen here. Okay, and we know that uh, if we stimulate, well, what, well what, what endothelium dependent hyperpolarization is, is that if you stimulate these endothelial cells, with acetylcholine or carbocol. So you can either stimulate with acetylcholine or you can stimulate with carbocol. Okay, and both of these are very similar structures uh, and are agonists at all types of acetylcholine receptors. So they're agonists for the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors and they're also agonists for the muscarinic acetylcholine receptors. So they are agonists at nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, and they're also agonists at the muscarinic acetylcholine receptors. So, endothelial cells have on their surface M3 receptors, muscarinic-free receptors, which are a G protein-coupled receptor. So, we can stimulate these M3 receptors using either acetylcholine, which is often abbreviated to ACH, or using carbocol, which is often abbreviated to CCH, like so. Okay, and then, what the phenomenon of endothelium-dependent hyperpolarization is, is that if you do so, what you find is that the smooth muscle cells in the tunica media surrounding uh, the endothelial cells, and remember there are quite a few layers in between uh, the endothelial cells and the smooth muscle cells. So for instance, you'll have the basement membrane, which I might draw here in green. You'll then have the subendothelial connective tissue, and then also the internal elastic lamina, which I'll draw in blue. But then surrounding the internal elastic lamina, you will have uh, smooth muscle cells. So let's say this is a vascular smooth muscle cell, a VSMC for short. And this in blue is the internal elastic lamina. Okay, right. So, um, basically, if you stimulate uh, the... Um, epithelial, oh, sorry, the endothelial cells with um, acetylcholine or carbocol, uh, then basically what you find is that the electrical potential difference across the membrane of the vascular smooth muscle cells nearby hyperpolarizes. So the usual electrical potential difference of the uh, vascular smooth muscle cell membrane is around negative 60 millivolts, okay? So usually it's around negative 60 millivolts, which means that if you measure the electrical potential in the extracellular fluid and then move into the intracellular compartment and measure electrical potential in the intracellular compartment, then if you were to move from the extracellular to the intracellular compartment, then the voltage or electrical potential difference that you would feel is equal to negative 60 millivolts. So how much different the intracellular compartment's electrical potential is from the extracellulars, which is the electrical potential of the intracellular minus the electrical potential of the extracellular. 
basically it's around negative 60 millivolts, which means that the electrical potential inside the cell is usually around 60 millivolts lower than the electrical potential of the extracellular compartment. Okay, but this difference is hyperpolarized. So basically, the amount by which the intracellular compartment is lower than the extracellular compartment is going to get even bigger. This number is going to become even more negative upon stimulating the endothelial cells with acetylcholine and carbacol or carbacol. Okay, and this was first observed by Bolton et al. in. Um, in 1984. Okay, so Bolton and colleagues uh, observed this in 1984, and they found that if you removed the endothelial cells, then you abolished this hyperpolarization in response to acetylcholine or carbacol. Okay, uh, so later it was shown that it cannot possibly be through nitric oxide that this uh, effect is seen. So it doesn't seem as though it's nitric oxide that is causing the hyperpolarization of the smooth muscle cells. And you can see that because if you use a nitrovasodilator such as sodium nitroprusside, SMP for short, which basically is a drug which will produce nitric oxide, okay? So it will undergo a chemical reaction and produce nitric oxide in the vascular system then this nitric ox well this drug doesn't produce uh, endo uh, doesn't produce this um, hyperpolarization in the vascular smooth muscle cell uh, so even though you've got nitric oxide it doesn't seem to produce the hyperpolarization so we don't think it's mediated by nitric oxide okay so what then happened is uh, Fellatu and Van Hoot did an experiment Okay, so Fellatu and Van Hoot is the next experiment we are going to um, look into. So Fellatu and Van Hoot. Okay, and they did this experiment in 1988. Right, so what did they do? Well, basically what they did is they took two blood vessels. So they took a blood vessel here. Okay, so this is a blood vessel here. And this blood vessel is still completely intact, okay? So its endothelium is completely intact. And they perfused this blood vessel, so they ran fluid through the blood vessel. They then collected the fluid that came out of this blood vessel and put it through another blood vessel, okay? Like so. So here is another blood vessel that we are now going to put this uh, blood through, okay? And uh, this blood vessel up here is known as the donor blood vessel, and this blood vessel down here is known as the detector. So, the donor blood vessel will have intact endothelial cells, okay? The detector blood vessel will have no endothelial cells, so no endothelial cells here. So it's just the smooth muscle cells. So you might ask, well, how do you remove the endothelial cells? Well, literally, you just scrape the side of the blood vessel, and that removes the endothelial cells. So you put in a little probe and then just scrape it against the side to destroy the endothelial cells. So this blood vessel has no endothelial cells. So it alone, if we stimulate it with carbacol or acetylcholine, it won't produce uh, any sort of hyperpolarization of the vascular smooth muscle cells. That's what Bolton et al. did in 1984. They showed that uh, if you remove the endothelial cells, you abolish this hyperpolarization. And in fact, you turn it upside down, it actually it turns into a slight depolarization as the acetylcholine and carbacol now directly stimulate the vascular smooth muscle cells. Okay, so. Um, Basically, what we're going to do is we're going to stimulate this smooth muscle cell, uh, sorry, this uh, blood vessel here, the donor blood vessel, which I'll colour in a red. We're going to stimulate it with acetylcholine and carbacol. Okay, so we're going to stimulate the endothelial cells there with acetylcholine and carbacol. Now, the idea is if these endothelial cells are releasing some sort of factor i.e. some molecule which causes the hyperpolarization 
in the um, smooth muscle cells, then the idea is that some of this factor, this so-called endothelium-dependent hyperpolarization factor, so we don't know what it is yet, but we've given it a name. If it exists, we'll call it the endothelium-dependent hyperpolarization factor, and it means just some molecule that would be released by the endothelial cells and cause hyperpolarization in the smooth muscle cells. If it existed, then the endothelial cells would be releasing it in response to the stimulation by acetylcholine or carbocol, and therefore it would be, uh, some at least, would be in the fluid that was coming out of the blood vessel. We can then uh, run this fluid through the detector blood vessel, and we'll obviously have to make sure that all of the acetylcholine and carbocol has gone at this point. So we won't, what, don't want any acetylcholine or carbocol coming through here, but we want whatever else comes out of the blood vessel. When we run it then through this detector blood vessel, okay, over here, which we'll have as the blue one, which remember has no endothelial cells of its own, and what you can see is that these smooth muscle cells become hyperpolarized. So these become hyperpolarized. So you can get these cells to become hyperpolarized when you're stimulating the endothelial cells over here, which shows, it demonstrates that there must exist an endothelium-dependent hyperpolarization factor. Otherwise, how is stimulation of the endothelial cells over here causing hyperpolarization over here? There must be some molecule that was being moved in the blood or in the fluid being, uh, being uh, perfused through. Uh, into this detector blood vessel, which acted on the vascular smooth muscle cells of this detector blood vessel and caused them to hyperpolarize. Okay, so that was what Feller II and Van Hoot did in 1988, and they didn't stop there. They thought they'd have a little go at trying to find out what this factor actually was. And what was the candidates they had? Well, basically, the candidate for an endothelium dependent hyperpolarization factor they were thinking of was some sort of prostanoid. Okay, so let me now explain to you um, some science. Let me explain to you some biochemistry. I want to explain to you what a prostanoid is, well, how it's different from a prostaglandin. Well, in fact, a prostaglandin is a prostanoid, but a prostanoid isn't necessarily a prostaglandin. Uh, and I want to explain to you all about cyclooxygenase enzymes and uh, arachidonic acid. But we'll start that in the next video.